الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما محمد إلا رسول صدق الله مولانا العظيم Alhamdulillah, we are talking about the seerah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But at this point, we are talking in excess of 20 generations before Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As we have acknowledged before and we have made it very clear, that many people will come with many different stories. I'm linked to Musa alayhi wa sallam, I'm linked to Ismail alayhi wa sallam, I'm linked to this and I'm linked to that. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was beautifully asked, are you linked and can you give us the linkage? And basically he was very honest, unlike you and I, that will make up things from here to Adam as if we are pure breed in everything. And Rasulullah did not lie. He says, from myself to Adnan, I know exactly the lineage. Basically, he said, it's 20, 20 generations back. Till day, I will say that there can be accountability for. But from Adnan to Ibrahim salam, definitely I cannot say uh, how many generations there are, etc. So what mind boggles me most is that the Prophet of Allah is honest regarding his background, what he knows and what he does not know. But you and I will say exactly who we are linked to, how we are linked, and we'll even make up a story. There was one fellow that I met, he says, well, you know, I know exactly that we are linked to so-and-so because of what my father told me and my grandfather told me. I said, brother, the Prophet of Allah was asked the same question. And he said, I know till a certain spot, beyond that I don't know. And you telling me that your grandfather and great-grandfather are better than Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Then he realized what he was saying. So many times we say things but we don't understand the consequences and the implications and the depth of our lineage and how it goes to where it's supposed to go. And this is a very important thing for us to know and talk about. Now last week we spoke about a gentleman, uh, an individual, between the time period, that means 20 generations, all the way up to Ismail alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, which according to Tabari, may Allah bless him, a historian and Muhammad bin Ishaq, is 47 generations maximum. So you had 47 plus 20, uh, plus 20, that gives you 67 from Rasul sallallahu alayhi salam, roughly to Ibrahim alayhi salam, 67. And you include 67 to where we are right now, you are pretty much hitting 100 generations away. I mean, it's a lot. That's how far away we are from, we can say, Millat Abikum Ibrahim wa Sammakum al Muslimin, in as far as the man that was first labeling us as Muslims, which also shows that if you are sincere in what you are labeling and what you are doing, Allah can give you success for generations and generations and generations to come. And it is because of His dua we can say categorically that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has continued to maintain the dignity of Makkah al Mukarramah and also to a great extent we can say Madinat al Munawwara as well. So we are talking about a person by the name of Tubba, Tubba Al-Akbar. And I will give you the shorter version of it rather than repeating everything we said last week. He was of course on his travel and he traveled via Medina to Munawwara, of course going to the sacred city, sacred lands. And one of the things that he was into was expanding his empire and taking over more land then some would say he should be taking over. So he left his child in the holy city and when he left his child there, as we say in today's time, Lord forbid, somebody hurt his child, in fact killed his child. And when they killed his child, he got very, very upset and he declared war against the people of that city. People came up to him and said, King, you are creating this evil against them. And one of the sound advice they gave him was based on the people's behavior. He was there to kill them. He was there to hurt them because they hurt his child. So in the morning and, and, and during the day period, he would hurt them. And during the night, the Ansar, as they were called, so we call Ansar, we think of it as this title beginning at the time of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But this title was there way before, in excess of 20 generations before Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
So now you get two things taking place. One is the Ansar as a group, and the other is the Ansar as the true helpers. As the Quran says, Kunu Ansar Allah, become helpers of Allah. You and I too can become Ansar, helpers of Allah, but not the Ansar of the one we are talking about from a historical point of view. And you'll understand exactly why. So as they were attacking, the people of Tubba were attacking during the day, at night the Ansar would actually send food. And they'll say, you know, a guest is our guest. We are the host. You do what you need to do. You want to hurt us, you hurt us. You play your role, you do what you wish to do. We are not going to lower ourselves for you. You know, there was an American military strategist, long time ago in history, you hear about it. People were saying bad things about him. So somebody asked him for a letter of recommendation and he wrote a beautiful letter of recommendation. So people said, but you know, how could you say all these great things about him when he said all these bad things about you? He says, he spoke from his mouth, I speak from my mouth. He spoke from his mouth, I speak from my mouth. It's a very powerful lesson that we learn from leaders, that leaders don't dirty their mouths. Leaders don't dirty their actions. And sometimes people will test you. It's a bad habit we have. We will test a person. You call yourself a leader, you call yourself this, and you call yourself that. We will squeeze the juice out of you to see if there's any juice left thereafter. And then we say, this guy faked it very well. How many years can you fake it? Five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Eventually the truth will come out. The same thing now we are learning regarding Tubba. So, what happened was, Tubba was doing what he was doing, leading and moving from one place to another, and he came across a tribe. And this here we learn now, he came in contact with the Hudayl tribe. Understand my young brothers and sisters, in your life people are going to set you up. Regardless of who you are, they're going to set you up, so you do the dirty work. It's human nature. Never, and this is again, I will talk about the uh, psychological impact and statements that were made. So the Hudayl tribe came to Tubba and they said, this is what they said to him, O king, allow us to lead you to an ancient large treasure. It is filled with pearls and rubies and gold and silver. King, let us take you to it. As we mentioned before, what happened to the Kaabatullah, it dried up and we spoke about that previously and a lot of treasures were thrown in there. So the Hudayl tribe were having a problem with the people near the Kaabatullah. They were having a problem. They couldn't resolve the problem. So when they saw Tubba, they said, now we're going to use this man. He will go and do the dirty work for us. Anyway, all this was going on, the fight, little bit here and there. And eventually, the rabbis told him, take it easy with the people of Makkah. If you're going to hurt them, you're going to get hurt. So he realized, luckily he caught himself before. And he got so angry at the Hudayl tribe that he went and cut their legs and cut their hands off. And some say he killed them. This was the punishment historically for people that are thieves. When people are thieves and they want to be highway robbers and take part in all these violent things, then this would be the punishment that will be given to them. Thereafter, of course, as you know, he had many wonderful dreams and the dreams were to, why don't you embellish or take part in fulfilling the Kaaba to Allah and making it such that the Kaaba can look very beautiful. So he had the first dream and he put palm leaves on it. He had another dream Thereafter, he put better fabric on it. Thereafter, he had a third dream. The third dream was when he put Yemeni fabric on it. And Yemeni fabric was one of the best fabric of that time. And instead of just throwing a fabric over, you know, sometimes you just throw, when you get a cheap tablecloth, you know it is cheap. How do you know it is cheap? It keeps on sliding. That's all it happens. It keeps on moving and one person pulls, another person pulls, and before you know it, everything is flying off the table. You know, when you are a child, you play a game, you pull the cloth off very fast on the table, and the plate will still remain on the table. Don't try it at home, young ones, please. You don't want to break your mom's finer, fine china. But what I'm saying is, that's how it is when you don't have the best of tablecloth. So we too have realized, as we improve in our tablecloths at home, what do you do? You get a tablecloth that has the cloth that falls from the side over here, 
but this part is sewn to another part that's flat on top. Some of you, I'm sure you know tablecloths, right? So anyway, the same thing is exactly what he did to the Ka'batullah. He started putting a drape with strips put together, strips put together, and he made it look very, very beautiful, so it will hold itself, and it will not look inexpensive, it will look magnificent, it will look beautiful. So he had three dreams. When he got this third dream, do a better job, he never got a fourth dream thereafter, which means that he really was the first person that took part in draping the Kaabatullah. Thereafter, Tubba did something very important. The Kaabatullah had open access. You could just walk in and walk out. Like if that door is not closed and there's another door here, you can walk in and you can flow in and out. Now there'll be a problem. If you have that door open all the time and that door all the time and you come in the Kaabatullah, then there's going to be a problem. It's going to be cold. In our case, if it was cold, there are going to be treasures. People can steal the treasures. So he created the first door, or rather he put a door and he created a unique first like lock system. So he was one of the first people that it is credited where he made a lock and key. And that's where now you see from there on a certain tribe begins to look after the key of the Ka'batullah. So the key of the Ka'batullah, you know you say so and so family has it, so and so this and so and so that. But in reality, this is where it is going towards. So his contributions were enormous and also at the same time, his respect for the Ka'batullah. A very important lesson is derived from historians over here. That you and I can intend wrong, you and I can do wrong. But once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to guide an individual, then Allah can make, He can change our evil into tremendous amount of good. Then after Tu'ba came another individual. Well, before I tell you that, I think I promised you something. The brother didn't remind me. I know last week he was smiling. There was a unique dream that took place. You remember I told him to share that dream with you? Oh, mashallah, he's smiling. That's good. Now, what happened was, Tubba once got a dream. And he wanted a meaning to this given dream. Now, how do you get a meaning to a dream? One is, what do you do? You share it to people, right? So you tell me the dream, and I give you the meaning. How do you know the meaning is true? Because you told me the dream. So it cannot necessarily be true if I gave you the meaning. Or the meaning could be true. Tubba was a little bit smart. So he said, I had a dream and I want his meaning. So he called all the people. And all his leaders said, so Tubba, you the king, tell us what the dream is. He says, no, no, no. I'm not going to tell you what the dream is. If I tell you the dream, then you'll say exactly, this is exactly what it was and at that point they said Tubba you are asking for something that is beyond our comprehension okay so how do I get the meaning they said there are two individuals out there these two individuals have great amount of insight and they will be able to tell you exactly what the meaning of this given dream is and one individual's name is Satih and the other one's name is Shik. He says, okay, fine, no problem. Call these two people down. So anyway, these two people came and they sat in front of the king. And the king told them, I want you to tell me the dream and I want you to tell me the dream without me telling you what the dream was. Now, this is a very important thing. Why I'm saying is this is a very important thing is because in today's time you go to people and they will also tell you your given dream but many of these people are working with shaitan they are working with evil jinn and they are working with that which is haram in nature and to go to them very important point it is haram to go to a soothsayer is haram to call up a person and say can you predict my future it is haram in fact, it comes in the hadith of Rasul Sallallahu and we derive from it that when you go to such people, then 40 of your salah can be rejected. According to some, 40 days worth of your salah can be rejected. Some say 40 salah, some say 40 days worth of salah. So therefore, to go to them 
to go to soothsayers is wrong in nature. Again, we are talking about a very long time period ago. So anyway, these two people came, one of them sat down and he began giving the dream. And some say it was Tubba, the second that had this dream, and others say it was Zayd bin Amr, the person that came after Tubba that had this given dream. Some say it was Rabi'a bin Nasr that had this dream. So there are multiple opinions. Now let me share this given dream with you. When he shared the dream, and I'll come to exactly, just bear with me for a few moments. The king said the following, O Satih, whatever you have said was truth in nature. Now, this dream becomes very important for you and I. I'll tell you why. From this dream onwards, you'll see a lot of truth coming into existence later in life. Let me share. He says the following, I'll quote. Ah, just one second, I don't want to share too much with you, but I don't want to take too much of your time. Sati says, you saw in your dream a skull-like thing. Now pay very close attention. The skull-like thing came from a very deep Part, and from a point of extreme darkness and it fell at a low portion of the ground descending to the sea and thereafter it began devouring everything that it came in contact with now hear very clearly this will come back later when we talk about the seer of Rasul he saw something let's just put it that way and this thing came from a dark part and as it came from there it started eating everything that came in its pathway and it started gobbling and gobbling and gobbling and wiping out and wiping out and wiping out until everything has been devoured the king said that's exactly what I have seen that's exactly what I have seen thereafter it was time to give an interpretation and he says the following a person from the Abyssinians will come forth one day. And this person from the Abyssinians that will come one day, they will start creating war and taking up much of the land. Now look at the way in which a man or a woman in control always thinks. If you tell me that or I tell you that, you say fine and you move on. A king, a president, a man in power doesn't want that. By nature, a king always wants one thing. They want power now and they want power even after they die. That's human nature. That's why they will formulate things to stabilize that. The children must take over, the grandchildren must take over, the political party must take over. This is their nature. So this is what the king says. You're telling me about an Abyssinian that will take over. This is very painful to me. I'm very sad that you are saying this. But tell me something. Tell me more about this individual. For how long will he take over? And by the way, Satih, will he take over when I'm alive or after I'm gone? This is the nature of kings. Will he take over after I'm here or while I'm here? In other words, what can I do to secure my kingship? So Satih was very smart. And he says, no, 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 don't, don't worry, king. 60 to 70 years after you are gone, then you will come. Okay, 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 alhamdulillah. No, now I'm happy. As long as I have my kingship, it's no problem. Thereafter, he says, okay, 60, 70 years later, this man will come and he'll do his nonsense and he'll take over and whatever he does, what happens thereafter? Thereafter, he says, this dominion of theirs will endure, but he'll be cut short after 60 or 70 years thereafter. And then there will come a very evil-like king. He's like a fugitive. He's a low-class individual, very ruthless in nature. And he will do things that are totally evil in nature. And he will, he will hurt, he will plunder, he will rule. 
The king said thereafter, who then will take over after this individual? And the Satih says, Iram of Du Yazan. This person will come and thereafter he will not leave a single people alive in Yemen if he could help it. He will do also a lot of bad things, but he will do what he needs to do. And the king says, how long will that be? Again, you are seeing a pattern here. People in power don't want to give up power. They want power. And you see now in Rasul Sallallahu later when he comes, he teaches us something very, very important. What does he say? He says to us, a powerful man is not a man that is a dictator. A powerful man is not a man that controls people's lives. A powerful man, a powerful woman is the one that gives up power for the sake of Allah. So you see all these things that we are learning now is embedded fighting, war, destroying, hurting, killing, controlling, doing every type of haram is in the so-called DNA code that has been plugged in for many, many generations. And later on, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will come by and change this. Anyway, thereafter he says, Satih, what's going to happen next? And this is where he gives a remarkable answer. He says, a prophet, a pure prophet, a pure one from amongst them, who will be inspired by revelation, he will come from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The king says, who will this prophet come from? Tell me a little bit more. He was very, very, uh, he was very, very curious. Tell me more about this prophet. And he says, look, I can't tell you too much, but he will come, he will control, Allah will, everything will come to him. And after his coming, Satih says, it will be the end of time and every man that has done good, every woman that has done good will go to heaven or go to hell. That's what Satih said. The king was really shaken. He was shaken at this point. So Satih, now you go. You go. He called another guy and his name was Shik. Shik was also at that time, those of you that came late, we are talking about a time between Ibrahim alayhi salam and the time of Adnan, which is 20 generations before Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you came late, please don't go and look for this in the, in the book of Bukhari saying, did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say this? Yes, some of this has been mentioned in some form or the other, but this has been mentioned by Ishaq, historians, Tabari, etc. So Shik comes in. When Shik comes in, the king said, oh Shik, I had a dream. I would, this dream has created tremendous amount of rest restlessness in me, I want you to give me the meaning. Now, Shik also gives the meaning. It's very similar. And again, I want you to open your eyes to something very important. The thing that I'm opening our eyes to is showing you something that the coming of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not done overnight. It was not done in a vacuum. It was predicted by Adam alayhi salam. It was talked about by Nuh alayhi salam. It was talked about by Ibrahim alayhi salam. It was talked about by his children. Throughout you see snippets, 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 little, little points being made until the coming of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So anyway, Sheik comes and he says, I'll tell you exactly what you saw, King. He says, you saw a skull which came from a dark area and fell upon the land, the meadows and the brush-like area and it devoured everything that came in its sight. The skull devoured. You know what it is teaching us right here, what we are learning? That a man will come in history and he'll wipe out all evil and bring good that will come thereafter. This was predicted thousands and thousands of years ago. When the king realized that this man now is saying the same thing as the previous man, and by the way, the king was smart. When, the, when Satih left, he made sure Shik came from a different door. So there was no communication between the both of them. They were supposed to be separated in as far as the giving of data was concerned. So you think FBI is good. FBI started off a long time ago. People are very experienced even back then. And by the way, just like people tried to beat the FBI, back then too people tried to beat one another. So kings were quite alert. So the king said, oh Shik, you have exactly said the right thing. So in your opinion, what is the interpretation of this? 
He says, I take an oath by every living being. There'll be the African that will come down on your land. Now, so anyway, this is what was said, that the Abyssinians will come and they will take over. And by the way, from a historical point of view, when you look at African history from this point of view, it was magnificent and brilliant. When you look at African history, go and study Timbuktu. Go and study Timbuktu. They had manuscripts upon manuscripts that will mind blow you. You think you have stuff in universities right now. When you look at the history of Timbuktu and what some of the people of African descent had maintained regarding knowledge and data and wealth, you will be amazed. Fort Knox looks poor. I repeat, Fort Knox looks poor to compare to what Timbuktu had had in not only knowledge, but also wealth. And that is a part of African history that I hope that inshallah in the future we will talk about. I think we spoke about it a long time ago, but I decided you should research and find out about it as well. So anyway, he says, the blacks will come down and they will seize custody of this land and they will take over and then rule over all of the land from a different group will come over and they will take over and it will create a very distressing moment and thereafter another group will come and they will do what they need to do thereafter Sheikh said something very very unique and thereafter he says when he's continually asked who will come who will come there's a slight change from Satish what he says but in the end he says something again very very important a day will come it will be called the Quran talks about this yawmahum barizun and there are different words a day of separation will come about meaning between humans their life and them stepping into hereafter so he says here the following a day will come it will be called the day of separation Quran talks about this by the way and he spoke about this back then a day of separation will come so the king says what is the day of separation what do you mean day of separation separation from what and he says the following to translate from the arabic to the english just one second it will be a day in which every individual the good they have done they will be given good for it and the bad they have done and they will be given the punishment for it and before this he says and as far as the leadership of the last group is concerned it will indeed come to an end who will it come to an end by it will come to an end look at the words now he uses by a man that will bring and separate justice from injustice who's this man that's why every day in khutbah every friday in khutbah what's the last words we read Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan Allah commands justice Allah commands good That's what we read at the end of khutbah And Sheikh is saying There will come a man And this man He will separate haq from batil He'll make it so clear You'll know right from wrong And wrong from right You'll know alcohol is going to destroy you You'll know gambling is going to destroy you He'll teach you that riba is going to Mess up an economy You know the bitcoin thing Go and study what's really happening out there There's a lot going on All these things He's going to make it crystal clear This is good and that is bad Sheikh is saying to the king That there will be such a man that will come one day and thereafter the king says and after this man comes he does all these wonderful things what happens then sheikh says yawmahum barizun after he comes then is jannah and jahannam separation between good and bad one goes here and the other one goes there so it's a very very beautiful story mashallah next week we will continue talking about a man by the name of hassan hassan was a unique character unique character in history and he became the next leader. Again, we see something very important. Every leader wants to be what? Every leader wants to be a leader. Every tribe you will learn from these stories wants to be dominant. My tribe, my people. You know where I come from? You know what we did? You know we did that. This is human mentality. We are learning from the story. Allah and from Rasulullah we learn later on forget your tribe, forget your people, forget your wealth, forget your history. 
in the sense of how great you are. Link yourself to humility, love and peace and Allah will take you a long way. And as far as this uh, individual, Hassan, he too was in power and he had a very, very unique brother. His brother's name was Umar. And his brother was told, don't do something that is wrong in nature. Don't hurt your brother Hassan. When you hurt your brother Hassan, your sleep will go away. Literally, this is what he said. Now, those of you that have brothers and sisters and you can't sleep at night, ask yourself, what did you do to your brother and sister? Humor aside, you know why you can sleep and cannot sleep. And this is what happened. They told Amr, don't mess with your brother Hassan. Let him be the power. He has the power Allah has given him. Let him enjoy. But no, 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 no. He wanted to teach his brother Hassan a lesson. Next week, we're going to talk about what lesson Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him as a result of his evilness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us at all times.